Today we talk about um, streaming, big data, and Flink. And before I start, I want to introduce myself a little bit. So my name is Volker, and I work at InnoGames, obviously, and I'm working there since, um, I think, yeah, more than seven years at least. I think something in between seven and eight. And yeah, we are making games, obviously. We're also producing a lot of data and try to improve our games by that. And this is something I want to talk about today. But before I do that, I want to take you on a road trip. And this is actually... It's a thought experiment where you can join in, and I think it's a good idea because I want to wake you up a little bit so that you don't fall asleep after the party. So you can join in for this uh, thought experiment, and the basic idea is that you should imagine that you are driving with your family on your back seat. So you're doing a road trip with your family on the back seat, and I really want you to imagine doing that by putting up your hands like this, so you're on the steering wheel, you're doing a you're doing a road trip, so at least some people of you, please join me in. Or you can also do like this, it's also okay. Like, however you drive, it's fine. <laughs> okay, so you're driving on the road, you're doing this road trip, and there's lots of traffic on the road, so you have to concentrate, especially after the party. Uh, you shouldn't drive, but still, um, <laughs> you're driving. And now you do something, yeah, something weird. You actually, while driving, you close your eyes. Literally do that. Close your eyes while driving. Imagine there's lots of traffic and, yeah, you just close your eyes and your family is on the back seat. And yeah, just take a moment and think about that. Okay, you may open up your eyes again. <laughs> how do you feel about that? I mean, how did you feel doing that? How did you feel, for example? Insecure, Insecure okay. Um, I'm sure you felt bad about it because what you did there was you put the lives of your loved ones into danger by not looking around you, not looking at the data that is around you, not looking at the instruments of the car or what you can see on the road. And that is obviously something, yeah, that's not good. It makes f you feel bad, definitely. I hope so, at least. <laughs> and would you ever do that in real life? I think the answer is clearly nope. You shouldn't do that, and you would not do that. I know that. Now, of course, this is a metaphor, and I want you to imagine that the car in this metaphor is your company, your team, or your project, and the passengers in this car, those are your colleagues or employees. Now again, the, the car is driving on the road, so you can imagine it as you driving in, in the business um, that you're working in. And all the instruments in the car is, of course, the data around you. And again, in a metaphorical sense, would you ever do that, closing your eyes while driving? I think the answer should still be no. But the thing is, lots of companies do that, unfortunately. Or they do a little difference. They keep their eyes closed until a certain moment, open their eyes, and then check all the data, and then close it again, and hope that everything works fine. And this is not good, because in the end, you have to process data on time as it happens. That is very essential, very important. And batch processing, in this case, that's what I was referring to, <laughs> might cause accidents. Because, and if you take out one thing out of this presentation, I would be happy with the next slide, because Life doesn't happen in batches. So this is a very important quote. It's unfortunately not by me. It's by um, Alan Friedman and Ted Dunning, two really good speakers. They're writing good books and articles. Also put the link here so you can check it out afterwards if you like. But the sense of this article is really that life doesn't happen in batches. So this is one of the key takeaways and motivations for my presentation in the end. Another motivation, well, you might have read through the description of my talk, and um, there I mention, well, ice cream, chocolate, and gaming, and actually it also somehow fits to the cinema topic that we have here, but of course you have popcorn and nachos and maybe gaming. Um, yeah, so what do those three things have in common? Basically, they make us happy, right? I mean, I think we can agree on that, at least those things make me happy. But there's another similarity. And to explain you that, I want to ask you the question, what do you think? Which ice cream tastes better? So who thinks that that one tastes better? Hands up, please. The one on that side. Yes, OK, many hands. That's what I expected, as you can see here. I think so, too. But the question is, why do you think that? You never tried the other ice cream or one of both, so you cannot know which ice cream tastes better. But this is something that is very normal for us humans. It's a cognitive bias. Um, actually, it's called the halo effect. Um, 
What it means is that the first impression counts, and this is very important. It doesn't matter if your customer steps into your, yeah, into your shop with the ice cream and the chocolate that you sell, or if your customer downloads the app and plays your app for the first time or uses the app. The first moment counts. In the first session, he will decide if he likes your app or if he likes the ice cream, or if he maybe wants to pay for your app or whatever, or if he dislikes the app. So the first impression counts, and the first moment yeah, the customer steps into your app or the shop, those moments count. And this is also, um, you can also say that in order to make a positive impact on your customer, a response needs to happen quickly. And this is also known as the time value of information. So this is very important because information not only has value, it also has a time value, it means that the value of information changes over time. There's even a business built upon this whole concept. I don't know, does anybody of you know this app, Waze? Yes, maybe hands up. Okay, some of you. Um, it's a pretty interesting app because, as you can see, it's some kind of navigation software. And what you get out of it are speed traps, traffic information, gas prices, also regular um, navigation, of course. And as a user, what you feed back is basically real-time user reports. So you go in the app and say, OK, hey, I've seen a speed trap on this road. And that's how it works, basically. And now imagine that this app would work with batch processing only. Then it would be like you open up the app and it says, by the way, on the road where we've been driving on yesterday, there was a speed trap. And this is not very helpful for you, of course. So there are even businesses built upon this whole idea of the time value of information. So the sense is really respond to life as it happens. But enough about the motivation now. Let's get back to our topic, which is streaming. And let's have fun with a little bit of streaming applications. First of all, what is streaming? So basically, almost any kind of data that gets produced is produced as a stream of data. If you think about it like GPS data, web interaction, or sensor data, all of that produces a stream of data. They have some kind of time relation and happen one after each other. And doing stream processing means now that I process data in motion. So while the data occurs, I'm processing it, processing data in motion. And independent from the technology that you use for that, it more or less almost always looks like this. So on the left-hand side, uh, on the right-hand side, <laughs> sorry, you have the source stream of your data. Then here you have your operator. This is where usually your code lives. This is your streaming application. And then maybe you have a data sync, so you create a new stream of data, also multiple streams of data, or no data at all. But this is overall how it basically looks when you do streaming applications. Now, the stream processing lake it is quite huge already. A couple of years ago, stream processing was not so easy to do. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's a tough task to implement streaming applications, but with new frameworks and also existing frameworks, this got much easier lately. And I want to talk about some of them at least. For example, very interesting is um, Apache Beam, which is a cool project that lives on top of your streaming engine. And you define your streaming applications in a DSL, and then you can choose on which streaming engine you want to run your streaming application. So you can say, OK, I want to run it in Spark, I want to run it in Flink, or whatever. So this is quite cool. Also interesting lately in the last couple of years is Kafka, Kafka Streams, um, which is tightly bound to the Kafka um, project itself which makes sense because in most data architectures, the stream lives inside Kafka, so it makes sense to do stream processing right there where the data is. Um, yeah, very interesting project for sure. And by the way, a little bit of advertisement for another talk. In Cinema 6, later on, there will be a talk about real-time processing explained, and from what I got from the description, you will see more of those options and see more information outside of this stream processing lake. So check it out. Today, I will talk about Apache Flink, so one concrete technology out of this lake. And yeah, it's all about Flink today. And what is Flink? It's a framework. It's also a distributed process engine for stateful computations on unbounded and bounded data streams. So that's what it is. But let's have a look at it step by step. First of all, what are streams or unbounded and bounded streams? So an unbounded stream is when you have a defined start 
but no defined end. So you, the data keeps coming, you keep on processing it, you have no defined endpoint in your data stream. The bounded streams, however, <coughs> they have a defined start and a defined end. So it's a clear set of data. And this might sound familiar to you because this is what we also know, uh, also known as batch processing. So in Flink, everything is a stream, but you can also do uh, batch processing, but it's called bounded streams in this case. Even that is basically rendered as a stream of data. Now let's talk about time. Time is a very important concept, not only in streaming, I think in life in general. <laughs> so time in streaming is not so easy. Time in batch processing, however, it's more easy because you can reorder your data set, you can easily do operations, but in streaming you have to think about time a little bit more. And I really like this uh, Star Wars reference because it fits perfectly to explain the two yeah, most important types of time within Flink or stream processing in general. And those are the Star Wars movies, as you can see, and now they are ordered by event time. That means by the time that they actually happened. And of course, episode one, The Phantom Menace, is the first one based on the event time. However, if I turn this around, now order everything by processing time, it looks different because now the events are ordered by the time they got processed or, in this case, the movies got produced. So instead of episode one, we start with a new hope, so episode four, and it goes on. And those are the two basic types of time in Flink and in screen processing in general, and you can choose which time your application uses, and it's very important. You see it makes a difference, definitely. Okay. Strongly connected to type, are the windows in stream processing. So usually you don't want to process just one element in your stream. Instead, you want to group your elements somehow by time. And you do that using time windows. And the basic one, that is also the default one, is the tumbling window. So imagine you have sensor data coming in. Let's imagine this is one and a half minutes of data. And we have windows of 30 seconds, so you end up with three windows and uh, three aggregation results, of course. And this is how it works. So the, you have 30 seconds of data, 30 seconds of data, and then again, 30 seconds of data. Now, the next type is the sliding window, which is a little bit different. And in most cases, you will use the tumbling window. But just to explain this one, um, there, the window moves together with your data, which means that you get kind of an overlap. And as you can see, the number three here, it's in two windows, same goes for the number two, and the number six, and you will end up with more aggregation results by that. This is maybe applicable if you do monitoring on sensor data, because you want to have um, yeah, more output values in, in the end. So those are the two types of windows. There's one more on Flink, which is really cool, which is called the session window. Um, I didn't use it so far, but um, it's also very interesting because it will detect gaps in your stream of data and then it will automatically group together the data in sessions and that is very useful, especially if you do tracking and web applications because often you don't know when you have a session. If you have a web app or a mobile app especially, you don't know when the, when the user is actually using the app. You cannot easily um, check if you have a session or what a session is and Flink helps you with that and that's pretty cool. Now, the holy grail of stream processing often is <laughs> exactly once. It is something that, yeah, it's not easy to achieve because we are in a distributed system and it's not easy to guarantee that stuff gets only processed once, exactly once. So this is always a big topic and often people build systems around it to deal with it. In Flink, you have exactly once, but you have to question what it means to have exactly once. In this case, it does not mean that each element in your stream gets only processed once. It means that each element only affects the final result once. So it's a little bit different, but very important. And Flink achieves this with distributed snapshot and state checkpointing, and I will explain more about this later. So yeah, that's the holy grail, basically. The building blocks in Flink. How can I create a streaming application with it? Well, you have three kinds of building blocks the data source, the transformation, and the data sync. And of course, you have APIs to define that. And we have APIs on different levels. You have the high-level analytics API, which is quite cool because you can define your streaming application in SQL. 
you do not have access to all the functionality, but it's, on the other hand, very easy to create a streaming application with this. I can also show you an example later if I have enough time. Let's see. Then we have the data stream API. This is kind of the, let's say, default thing that you use. You can use it in Java. You can use it in Scala. There's also a Python uh, way to um, connect to Flink and also to define your streaming applications, but that is still in beta and I didn't try it out yet. So, But it's quite interesting. And then again, you have the low-level process function, and this is basically, yeah, you have all the power that Flink offers. You can do everything, but also your application is very, very expressive, so you have to write a lot of code compared to the other solutions. Okay, let's have a closer look. How does a Flink application look like? In the end, this is a complete example, and I try to make it as simple as possible. So we have a data source that has a static stream, just the numbers one, two, three, and four. Then we have a map function, which takes an integer and produces an integer, and what it does is it adds a number two to it. Then we have a filter function that gives me only the elements that are dividable by two. And in the end, we have the print function, which will just output stuff to STD out. So this is basically a very simple Flink application. Then, of course, you execute it, and then you're happy because, yeah, this is how it goes. Now, when you have your app defined, you not only want to run it local in your IDE, you also run it, want to run it in some kind of runtime environment. Flink offers different possibilities to do that. So as you can see, you have Mesos, Kubernetes. You can also run it on Yarn, or you can use a standalone cluster for that like we do at InnoGames, for example. And the Flink runtime, well, I've seen a presentation about it, and they said that it's very good in hiding its internal details. And I like this because actually you don't need to know too much about it. You can focus on your application, on your streaming application, and that is good. And you can say, okay, the runtime is some kind of magic. I don't care how it runs. But today I still want you to take you down the rabbit hole just for couple of minutes, don't worry, we don't go into too much detail, but just that you get an idea how it works in the end. So what the Flink runtime does is it converts your application into a streaming data flow. That's the thing that you can see on the top. The streaming data flow combines now operators whenever it makes sense, so you have operator chains, or it leaves the operators alone. And in the end, those elements are tasks, and afterwards, your streaming data flow is paralyzed, and you get so-called stream partitions. So you can say, OK, I have subtasks of each task, and that is how I paralyze the workload. And each Flink cluster has a job manager, which is coordinating everything, and it has task managers, which are running all that stuff. And each of those is a JVM. And in the end, each of those subtasks is just a thread running in, each, uh, in one of those JVMs. And this is basically how it works. It's very simplified, but I think you at least get an idea. Okay, let's talk about checkpointing. Now, checkpointing is one of the key concepts in Flink. It's super important. It's not black magic in the end, and I was quite amazed when I read about the details because it's based on a paper out of 1985. I mean, that's, that's quite old and quite amazing, and I was born in that year, and they use a paper about distributed um, yeah, checkpointing um, from that year. That's quite amazing. And yeah, it works really well, and it's not super complicated. So what they do is they inject so-called checkpoint barriers into the stream, and whenever an operator gets such a checkpoint barrier, it will just get the state and the current uh, position of the stream and stores it. So that's the basic idea. Of course, in the end, there are more details about it, but I think you get the basic idea. And you, of course, have state in Flink. State is very important, not only for the checkpointing, but also for your applications. And state in Flink is quite simple. You have pluggable backends. You can choose where the state is stored. You have multiple primitives um, that you can use for your state. I can also show you an example later, if the time <laughs> not runs out. And the cool thing is, whenever you use state provided by Flink, you have guaranteed consistency in case of failure and restart. And that is quite important for a lot of streaming applications. Yes, so much about state. Okay. Good. Now let's talk about streaming at InnoGames. So we got a little details about how, yeah, how streaming and Flink works in general. Now let's see it in action. But before, 
few words about Nano Games. So we were founded in 2007. We have seven live games with more than 30 language versions, and we have more than 400 employees and the headquarters here in Hamburg. And yeah, we are making games. We're making online games with focus on mobile. And to show you some of them, those are the games live right now. Um, you might know some of them, like Forge of Empires and Tribal Wars. And of course, all those games, they produce data. That's obvious. They produce the data that we use for the stream processing. How does that look like? We call it event tracking. Um, yeah, and if you imagine you play a game um, and you interact with the game, you create events while doing so. For example, if you build a building, you get a build event. If you do a fight, you get a fight event, and so on and so forth. So while interacting with the game, you create data for our data stream. Now, the thing is, I also brought you a number, which is one billion. <laughs> and yeah, we have one billion events per day. Now, remember, I think it was four years ago, I was also standing here. I think it was also right in the cinema. Um, and there, I think we had 200 million or something. So we also improved in, in that sense. And it was not an issue for us because the architecture that we use is very scalable on every level. So not only on the streaming level, but also on the data store level. How does that look like? So the data architecture itself is split into two parts. We have the, uh, the real-time side of things and the batch side of things. So on the pipeline part, we talk about milliseconds, seconds, and minutes. And then on the batch part, like usual, we talk about hours, days, or even years of data that gets processed. And even though technology's changed and we adjusted a little bit, it almost always looked like this from the beginning. So um, <coughs> on that side, you can see that we have the game clients. They use something called event client that is tracking the data within the games. Then we have a gateway, which is our entry point into our whole data world, basically. Then we have the event bus, which is the stream representation of our data. And there is where we do stream processing in the end. And last but not least, we have the data store, which is basically where the data ends up and where we do batch processing. And it's also the place where we feed data to other systems, like our business intelligence system. Now, technology-wise, we're using a lot. We're using Go for the client. We have Drop Wizard, Kafka, Flink, Scoop, Hadoop, MS SQL Server, Jenkins, Hive. It's quite a lot, I know. But don't worry, today we focus on the streaming part only. I mean, I could talk hours about each of those components, but we have to focus on something. So today it's a streaming part. And I want to show you some examples that we do using streaming. So first example is event metrics. And what I like about this project is that it really is quite simple from the code base. So you can see a very short code. And the outcome is very huge for the game developers in the end. And I brought you the code, actually. It looks like this. Um, of course, a little bit of glue code is missing. You have to define the environment. You have to run that stream processing application. But essentially, that's, um, that's the logic behind it. So what we do here is we have some kind of object that we call the stream event, which is a yeah, portal representation of the events that we have. And the first step is that we map it to a tuple. And the first value of the tuple is the event name. The second tuple uh, element of the tuple is the number one. What we do then is a key by zero means we split our stream based on the first element in this tuple, the event name. And by that, Flink will distribute or create streams each uh, one for each event that we have, event type. And then we just do an uh, aggregation function, the sum function here, and we sum up um, the second part of the tuple. So we do basically the famous word count example just with events. And in the end, we send all of that to Graphite. And what we get out of that are dashboards that can look like this. So imagine you have some kind of graph that shows you the fight events in for the Forge of Empires or whatever game, or maybe this is all games, and you can see the differences between them. And there we have another metric. Maybe it can be, can be the tutorial finish rate or something like that. And all that gets updated in real time. So that means if a game developer is implementing changes for the game, he can just look after the deployment. Hey, did I change somehow the player behavior within the game? And this is quite important, because often the dashboards that you have after a deployment are very 
focus on technical stuff like numbers of requests or the server load or whatever, but this gives you more insights about the player behavior and how that changed after deployment. Next project is the Log00 monitor, and I have to explain that term, I guess. It's a KPI that you use in game development that says, on the day after the registration, how many players did log in from that registration? So usually you think, okay, if I register for a game, I should end up in the game. But this doesn't always happen. There might be technical issues. Users might close their browser or the app, or they lost the connection or something like that. But this is a very important indicator if something goes wrong. So what we do here is, first of all, we have our stream again. And we only care about two types of events, registrations and logins. And we split everything by players so that we distribute it um, over the cluster. And then we use something called Flink CEP, which is also quite handy, um, because you can define patterns. And then CEP will do pattern detection within those streams. And for doing that, state is very important, by the way. You could also create that on your own, but Flink CEP helps you a lot with it. And in this case, what we do is we say, OK, we want to begin our pattern with a registration event. Afterwards, we want to have a login event. And all this should happen within 60 seconds. That's the pattern. Then we execute the pattern. And what we see here is we can um, say what happens in case of a timeout or in case of a success. In both cases, we send data to Graphite. And in the end, you get something like this. Again, a real-time graph that shows you the yellow line is basically no logins within one minute. The green line is you had a login within one minute. And this is a very important KPI that is also an indicator if something goes wrong. Because the funnel is very important, I think, everywhere in web development. And this monitoring this in real time is really essential to see if something goes wrong in some game or some application. Then we have something called near time SAM. Um, yeah, I think I have enough time for that. So near time SAM is another project that we have, but it's not really a Flink application, but it is a streaming application. So it looks more or less like this. I try to reuse the components you have seen in the data architecture. So we have the event line again, the gateway, the event bus, and then we have some kind of yeah, the Java application, a custom Java application that uses the Kafka consumer. And what it does, in a very simplified manner, is that it takes the events, combines it with some kind of player data, and then decides if it has to show the player something. So showing the player means showing him interstitials. Those are yeah, kind of pop-ups within the game, so I think you have seen stuff like that already. And with that component, we can yeah, steer them out more in a yeah, smart manner, I would say. And the cool thing is we can react to events within less than 10 seconds with this. And to give you one example why this is so important, in Evna we have this trading feature, um, which is, yeah, you, you build a trader and after that you can do trading. Sounds simple, but a lot of players have issue with that. Because if you don't use that feature, you will stop the progress in the game. You will not get the resources that you actually need. So we have to ensure that those players who not use the trader and maybe don't understand how it works, that exactly those players get an interstitial that explains them how to do it or how to deal with it. And this is what we do. And yeah, we just show them an interstitial. And this is much better um, instead of showing an interstitial to all the players at a certain point in time. We just show it to those players who really need it in the end. OK, I also brought you a demo, a live demo. I hope it works. Um, I also put it to GitHub. Um, small disclaimer, the code is not very pretty. I mean, I scrambled it together very fast, but I think you get the idea of it. You can check it out later, don't worry. Um, let's see if it really works. Okay, I think, yeah, you can read it. It's huge, <laughs> I guess. Okay, so this is one example I created. And the idea here is the following. I have a stream, as you can see here, with a source function. And this source function is something I implemented on my own. It's a custom source function. And it records the microphone volume level um, of my laptop. And yeah, that's what it's doing. And it sends the data out as a stream. I have those volume level objects that are generated. And what I do in my streaming application is, oops, sorry. 
I have a map function that maps the volume level to a float value by just getting the amplitude of the volume. Then we have a time window of three seconds, and then I just take out the maximum volume, volume and I print it out. That's basically it, very simple, and that's my streaming application, then I just execute it. And if I do this now, yep. If I do this now, hopefully every three seconds we will see the current volume level there. So 1.0.1, uh, .1. what it means, don't worry, uh, is somehow it represents the volume level, just, just like that. <laughs> okay, and now I have a little experiment. I don't know if it works, but we will see if it works. And I need you guys for that, so I need your help. And I have to do something that you should never do as a speaker. I have to ask you for some applause and some noise. So you have to be a little bit loud so that we can see what the peak of your volume is if you do that. So it would be cool if you can help me out and give me some applause right now. I'm sorry for that. So. Ooh. Okay. That was more than expected. Whoa, okay. <laughs> Why not? Um, we can see 0 0.9, that's, that's quite huge. Um, let's keep this value in mind for the next example. The next one is a little bit more expressive, but don't worry, the code is quite simple. The base is the same, we again have the volume level stream, we again do some mapping of the volume level to the amplitude, we do a time window, and then we apply a custom window function. Oh, that's huge. Okay, we apply a custom window function that I implemented, and in the end, what I have here is a state. So I'm using um, the Flink state here, which is just containing a Boolean, and it's called triggered, and that means what I want to do in the end, I want to trigger something only once, so I keep track if I already triggered it. Um, very simple. And then I have the apply function, and the apply function is called as soon as the window is complete. Now, what does it mean? Window is complete means not that only those three seconds have passed, because Flink has, has also functionality to deal with late events, which means um, it will wait a certain amount of time if there are maybe events coming in late, and then it will execute the window afterwards. I disabled the feature so that we don't have to wait, don't worry. Um, yes, and what I do here, I get the maximum out of the volumes. I check if I have triggered already, if not, and the maximum is more than 0 0.9. Um, I do out.collect, which is actually creating a new output stream. So as you've seen in the very beginning of the presentation, remember from your operator you have output streams, and with out.collect I feed stuff into that output stream. And in this case my output stream is just string, or string values. And yeah, this open function is just um, to create the state, to initialize the state. So don't worry about that. And in the end, we have one sync in this case. It's a Twitter sync. It's another um, yeah, component that I implemented for demo purposes. Um, yeah. And to show you that demo, I have to change the layout a little bit. Yeah, cool. So on the left-hand side, you can see my um, Twitter feed. And on the right-hand side, you see the code. And now let's run it again. Hopefully it works. Hopefully I have, I have Wi-Fi connection. Let me check that first. Yes, I have. Good. You see nothing, but the application is running. That's expecting. And now I have to ask you once more to give me applause. You have to be as loud as before, so try it. Please. <laughs> huh? Worked. <laughs> Whew. I for a second, I thought it would not work. Okay, as you can see, the tweet appeared. Um, basically, the output stream was redirected to the Twitter sync, which was then posting on Twitter. And yeah, so this post is basically powered by Flink. So thank you very much for that. Okay, that was the demo. And of course, you can also get in touch with me and with Inno Games. If you like all those data topics, of course, we are hiring, also in that sector especially. <laughs> and yeah, I appreciate feedback a lot. So you can contact me on Twitter if you like, send me a direct message or whatever. And give me feedback for my talk so that I can improve it. That's very important for me. And 
yeah, what you should take out of the presentation is that life doesn't happen in batches. That's very important. It's important to do stream processing, and there are lots of technologies out there. Flink is not the only one. Kafka Streams, for example, is also super interesting. Also Spark, um, which deals then with micro batches. But there are so many technologies out there that are really cool and make stream processing easy, so we should do it. And in that sense, yeah, eat ice cream and stream on. And if you're interested in Flink, I recommend to check out that Flink training. It's for free from the creators of Flink. And yeah, it takes you one day to maybe go through the training. And then you will have learned all the stuff that I showed you in the presentation. So in that sense, thank you very much and enjoy the conference.